Hello and welcome everybody to the European WCS Austin Qualifier, live from Cologne, Germany. I'm of course Kevin van der Koy. This definitely feels a little 2010, 2011, me sitting here by myself. Of course, tomorrow I'll be joined by Todd and uh, the next two days as well, even though we'll have one day, uh, one day break in between. I'm excited, guys. I'm excited to see Europe's best in action. Of course, we already had the ladder qualifier happen, so that means that eight players are already seated. But today should still be really good. There is a ton of talent in Europe. And there's a ton of people who would love to make it out to Austin, even though it's going to be very hard, because we already know eight players that are going to make it into Challenger. But before we're going to go ahead and jump into the games today, let's take a look at what today is all about. As we have some graphics for you, today is going to be a single elimination tournament. Each match is going to be played in a best of three. It's a 128-man bracket, and four players will qualify for Challenger. That means they already secured themselves money, and of course, they'll still be in the running to make it to Austin and that big tournament that's happening towards the end of April in uh, Texas where everything is bigger, including the StarCraft show, and it's going to be fantastic. I'm really excited for it. It's been a long time since I've cast it by myself, but uh, if I look at this bracket and I see a couple of the names, I think it's not going to be an issue at all. I've been playing a lot of European ladder lately, so I'm pretty damn familiar with the majority of these guys. And I'd say, uh, let's take a look at the bracket as I have it on my screen. We can full screen it real quick. Over here on the top side of the round of uh, 128, we see a man that I expect to make it today. Saro is incredibly good. We saw him at Katowice, he had a great run there. And Saro is a guy that should have actually made it when the top eight players would qualify from the ladder directly into Challenger. However, he was on a holiday, so he couldn't play the amount of games he was supposed to. But he's here, and if he doesn't make it today, well, he has another shot tomorrow. And of course, I will be joined by Le Todd. I'm so excited, guys. I'm going to be talking about Todd a lot today, just so you guys know. <laughs> Damn, for the people wondering, like, where is Todd? Todd is actually getting a tattoo. And that was scheduled months ago. And today was supposed to be uh, a day where he didn't have to cast. So it was set in stone. He couldn't cancel it. But that's OK. I'll hold down the fort. Scrolling down, I see over here Minato. And that's going to be an interesting matchup, potentially, between Cero and Minato, which is what I'm expecting over here in the run of 32. Minato is a Zerg player from Ukraine that I thought years ago was really going to be the next big thing in Europe. I really thought this kid was incredibly talented. I thought he was going to go very far. And he's good. He's one of those guys that everyone will always say that he's good, but he doesn't have the results to back it up. And I think he lost some motivation down the road. But I'm happy to see him uh, give it a shot today. And let's see. Hopefully we can get that game on stream. That would be awesome. Over here we've got Beastie as well. Beastie is, of course, always a potential uh, candidate to go very far, but he's also on the side of Serral, so that's going to be rough for him. Paranoid old school Zerg from Poland was also at Katowice. <laughs> we got uh, Kulti over here as well. Very strong Russian Protoss. Risky is strong uh, from the UK. Also a Zerg above 6k MMR. Same goes for Sulir, who's a 6k MMR Zerg from Spain. And you got Shadon over here as well. Damn, so many good European players. This is going to be a great day, guys. And Zenster, of course, a very strong Zerg from Sweden. Perhaps a little clash of the north over here between Solo and Zenster, as both are pretty strong Zergs. Slightly favors Zenster there, but we'll see if that actually happens. Space Marine, strong Danish Protoss. Don't hear as much from him as we used to, but he's a good player. Braddock, old school as they come. I mean, 2010, Homestory Cup 1, Braddock was already there. Very first IEM, Braddock was already supposed to be there, but then got replaced by Moro. Moro, of course, ended up winning it. We've got Guru, everybody's favorite Zerg from Poland. Sort of is over here as well. I wonder if Sort of is already in Korea, and if he's playing this cross server, that's going to be very difficult for him. Hino is one of the French Zergs who was also in Katowice, a very aggressive, as the man from Rounders would say. Uh, Dimaga, of course, always have to mention Dima. Needless to say, damn, I'm only talking about Zerg today, not a strong Zerg from Ukraine. We've got Indy, a Polish Protoss. I'm excited to see if Indy can get anything done today. Kr is pretty good. Let's see if he's gonna have a good run. We've got another old schooler here, Cash, good old Misha Heda. 
man, it's, it's amazing actually if you think about it that some of these guys were already competing in StarCraft in 2010 when I was sitting here by myself as a young man wondering what was going to happen with this beautiful new RTS that was announced and now six, seven years later these guys are still here still trying to make their dreams come true we've got Rain, we've got Talantros as well he even made it to uh, Katowice stranded in the open bracket but it was awesome to see him there Hellraiser, Lila Cannon, Ooh, we've got Yogo, arguably the best playing caster worldwide, and that hurts me a little bit to say it, but Yogo is very strong, he's over 6k MMR as well, would be great, Yogo against Lila Cannon would be a fun matchup, Ooh, we've got Stefano over here, and we've got Creed, Stefano has actually been playing a lot lately, and he's been posting some pretty good results, and he said he was really going to do his best, and if Stefano tries, guys, He's always a worthy contender. We've got Optimus, one of the strongest Terrans in Europe that doesn't have the results to back it up yet, but he's up there, guys. Trust me, he's coming. Hate Me, of course, is very strong as well. Bly, Daishi. Majestic is actually making a little bit of a comeback. The Spanish Protoss. It's been a while since I've seen a whole lot of him, but it's cool to see him play again. We've got Denver and Casper. We've got Fighting Frog from Sweden. I think he's a random player if I recall that correctly uh, maybe he's gonna race pick in this tournament but there is a frog that's a random player in Grandmaster League Europe close to 6k MMR that could be him would be very cool to see somebody play random and go far in this tournament Lambo I'd say one of the favorites he, Lambo actually got pretty damn close to making top 8 off the ladder was just a couple hundred points short at best but he was in the running we've got Strange Fallinger over here as well DNS, somebody who was incredibly close, kind of heart-breaking uh, DNS's story. I looked at his MMR and I was like, damn, DNS is high. It was like 6,700. It was really close to getting a direct seat into Challenger. In the end, unfortunately, he didn't make it, but boy, oh boy, did he get close. And I already thought that was very impressive. And over here, all the way on the bottom side of the bracket, we've got Hero Marine as well. So needless to say, an insane amount of talent when it comes to the European scene here today in this qualifier. Four of these guys, of all the players that I just went over, or maybe somebody I didn't mention, that's possible as well. Wouldn't that make me look stupid, guys, if just like three out of the four guys qualified that I didn't even mention. Um, are gonna qualify today, secure themselves of at least $400, and of course, like I said before, they'll be in the running to get one of those top four seats in actual Challenger, and that would, uh, you know, get all expenses covered to go to DreamHack Austin, or WCS Austin, I should say, towards the end of April, and I'm excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. Just looking at this bracket, if I have to make a prediction right now, you guys should totally tweet me your predictions. I believe we've got a little, uh, you know, we, we, we've got a new sticker on the bottom. I think my Twitter comes by every now and then. You guys should tweet at me. Who do you think? is going to qualify today. I think Saro is going to be everybody's number one pick. He's also the highest seeded player in the tournament, all the way on the top side of the bracket. After that is going to be interesting. It's a raw spot for Beastie. I actually think if Beastie had a better side of the bracket, I think Beastie could have made it. Uh, we'll see. I already had an invite, actually. Oh, go, go. Okay, sorry, guys. Oh, man, this multitasking. Woo! It's been a while, guys, and I've done this all by myself. Uh, talking about Beastie, we actually got a lobby invite for our first best of three of the day. Game one is going to be played on Abyssal Reef. Somebody said that, uh, Roddy, I will be assisting you with the games. That's awesome, because in 2010, guys, I remember when I was sitting here, I had to do the switching, the sound, and the game invites. These days, I'm just a lazy old man. I'm just sitting here and waiting for people to get it done. But I'm just going to let them know I'm ready. Um... Cool, so we can see in what shape Beastie is in. He's going up against Armax. I'm going to take a look at his profile real quick. Totally think it's uh, appropriate for me to do that. He is a Grand Master League player. I assume that he's Zerg. Uh, it seems like a Zerg player. Armax is... No, he's wait, it's Shadow. For some reason, his profile... No, actually, that's a mistake in Battle.net. He's ranked 52, 6,200 MMR Armax. So that's actually going to be one hell of a match over here in the run of one... 28. Armax against Beastie. Beastie, one of the guys that's really high up on the ladder. I wouldn't say he was incredibly close to making top 8, but hovering right, you know, right below that. And he's one of those guys that you always have to look out for. However, once again, this is top side of the bracket. There is a chance that the winner of this series will go up against uh, Saro in the later stages of this tournament. <laughs> Beastie saying, Kev, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Beastie. 
it's 2010 all over again. <laughs> okay, uh, go, go. I'm ex ex apparently I'm in charge. Just confirming one more time, making sure the players didn't all tap. RMX says go. And Beastie is ready to go as well. So here you have it, guys. Your first best of three of the day live from Cologne, Germany. WCS Austin Challenger Europe qualifiers day one. Tomorrow will be the second day of the qualifier. Four more players will qualify. Then we're going to take one day off because I have to eat all the schnitzels in Cologne. Literally like 17. And then I'll be back, you know, three days from now on with a massive belly. Latot by my side. Things can't go wrong. We're, uh, we're ready, guys. Let's go ahead and hop into Abyssal Reef. Very fun map. We can talk about it, of course. Over here on the right bottom side, we're looking at the main base of our Serbian Terran player. One of the most creative Terrans, I would say, in Europe. Somebody that loves to mech it up a little bit every now and then as well. It's Beastie. I don't know why. Is that a Hydralisk? Beastie. You gotta represent your race, bruh. Should be a Reaper. Or a Hellion, in your case. And over here on the left top side of the map, we're looking at a Zerg player that I'm not incredibly familiar with. But that's just because he's... Ooh, there's a shark blocking my view. That's because he's a little too high for me on the ladder, guys. 6,200 MMR. It's Armax. Great opportunity for us to learn a little more about one of these guys that's apparently been grinding on that European ladder. He's been putting in the hours. Opening up very aggressive over here. Very early uh, extractor and relatively early pool as well. Well, when I say very aggressive, I don't mean that he's going to go all out. Balls to the wall, all in. But... There is potential here for perhaps to uh, to do something cheeky. Beastie is not going to scout just yet. Maybe he'll scout with the SCV as soon as the barracks is done. But most likely this is going to be a Reaper opening. Beastie is a Terran player representing my insanity that also streams. And that's something I think it's worth mentioning because there aren't that many players on this level. Well, Beastie is changing his mind there. He had a Reaper. He was like, you know what, Roddy? I'm not going to make you look stupid in your first game of the day. I'll build a Reaper. And actually, well, it was not my plan, so I'm still going to make you look a little stupid, but you'll partly be right. He's going to cancel the Reaper and just go for the CC on the low ground. And now I truly wonder how many links is uh, Armax going to produce on the other side of the map. And I wonder if he can get anything done. This is going to be two links for now, so I don't think he will be get anything done with this. There's a small chance that maybe these links arrive right before the first Marines are out. And then he can start nibbling away, just to give Kolaris some credit on this SUV. But I don't even think that the links are going to make that, as Marines actually built pretty damn fast. So, so far, BC is totally in the clear. Has not scouted, completely in the dark. Apparently he's not that worried about anything at all. And he's like, no, I've got a reactor on my barracks. I'm going to be fine over here. It's going to work on this Overlord. That Overlord is actually in trouble, I think. That's two Marines right below it. I'm pretty damn sure that this Overlord is going to fall, and I don't really understand how that can happen this early on into the game. Perhaps Armag was, you know, expecting a Reaper opening. He's expecting the Reaper to be across the map, and then the Reactor to be added. So he's like, ah, this Overlord is saved. There should be no Marines here. While Beastie is on the hunt, he's going to go for that second Overlord as well. This is a phenomenal start for Beastie and a disastrous start for Armax. And this may not look that big. You may be looking at this game, it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, losing two Overlords is not good, and losing the two links, but that doesn't really matter. This is not that bad. It's actually really bad. Like, this is not supposed to happen. You're talking about, you know, pretty damn high-level play over here. It's hard to make the difference. All of these guys practice their butts off. They really put in the hours. This is actually a little bit risky what BC is doing because there's a lot of links on the production tab. 14 links. BC is just sniping overlords left and right. He's going to find overlord number three. It's safe to say that BC has done this quite a few times. But now I do wonder, can these marines make it home safely or is he just going to sacrifice all of them? Even if he loses all these marines, which I think is going to happen because that's, I think, a few too many links, even though the Hellions are showing up. Well, still good wraparound there. I wonder what would have happened if these Marines were tucked away into a corner and then the Hellion showed up. Then I think they would have actually been safe. At least BC doesn't end up losing uh, the Hellions. What a great start for Beastie Cutie. 
from Serbia, picking off 15 links and three overlords already with just his first six marines. Now there's a cloak banshee going up on the other side of the map. It's going to be incredibly difficult to scout this for Armax. And I think that Armax just had enough of this game. He's like, you know what? I lost three overlords in the beginning of the game. There's absolutely zero chance I'm going to turn this into a macro game. So I'm going to Baneling boss instead, but Beastie is more than ready. Look at these badass Hellions, by the way. This is actually the first time I see them in action, believe it or not. I have not played against anybody who had them, but this looks beautiful. First links will run in, a couple of bailing show up as well, but this is not supposed to work. Against somebody like BC, the only thing you can hope for is that somehow he all taps and the bailing splash right on top of these Hellions. But look at the control, Armex knows it as well, GG. Beastie picks up game number one in what I would say is almost a flawless victory there, and I know that he did end up losing a couple of Marines. But that's as clean as it gets, and this is not a fir an easy first round draw. Armex, um, who actually seems to be from Belgium, I just checked the bracket because I was like, all right, generally don't know this guy, but he has a Belgian flag on the ESL website, which is really cool. That excites me because I was just wondering the other day, what was this morning in the train? Because everybody is thinking a lot on trains and obviously you play a lot of Starcraft, you think about Starcraft. I was like, if I move to Belgium, I might be the best player in Belgium. Well, apparently not because Armex has a lot of MMR, 6,200. And it's been a while since we had a good representative from Belgium. Of course, in the very early days of Starcraft, some of you guys may remember, oh really? Not like really, but just O-R-L. Uh, o -R -L. Why? He skipped a couple of characters in between there. He actually won one of the very first or maybe the first Go For Starcraft 2 Cup ever. Was a former WoW player. Everybody was upset. They're like, <gasps> no, this is not supposed to happen. Oh, these tournaments are supposed to be won by Brood War players or maybe by a Warcraft 3 player. But even that was not supposed to happen. But it was definitely not supposed to be won by a World of Warcraft player. But O'Reilly really did it. He did win one of the first Go for Zero Starcraft 2s. But after that, he kind of fell off. And then, of course, we had Feast for a while. Uh, pretty strong Belgian Protoss that represented against all authority. Made it to the Intox 3 Masters in Kiev. What I believe was 2011, but don't quote me on that. And made it either to the semi-finals or quarter-finals. The tournament that MMA won. Alrighty, uh, making sure Blaze are ready. Go, go. Armax and Beastie. Game two is going to be played on Newkirk. Seems like both players are ready. Alrighty, I hope for Armax that he's going to be able to give us a better showing because I am sure that that game was not a good uh, indicator of his actual skill level. If you have a record that speaks for itself like that with his profile, you're supposed to do better than that. Losing three overlords that quickly. I mean, I want to give kudos to, for, to Beastie for skipping the Reaper, getting the faster Marines, and then obviously knowing what to look for. It's all, I mean, we know Beastie, and he's also been around since 2010, so nobody in his right mind would ever accuse this man of map hacking. But if you didn't know any better, you're like, oh my God, I just played this ladder game, and this guy made six Marines, and he immediately ran them to my first three overlords. David Kim, are you watching? And David would be like, well, yeah, it's one of the best errands in Europe. That's what happens. It's like, no, it's not supposed to happen. Over here, on the right bottom side of Neil Kirk, hoping that he can give a, a better performance here in game number two. It's Armex from Belgium. It's been a long time since I said that, guys. And over here on the left bottom side, I think there is a very good chance that if he doesn't make it today, perhaps tomorrow will be his day because he has a tough bracket today. But let's see how far he can go. Representing Serbia, it's Beastie. Already mentioned his stream, guys, in the previous game. After he cancelled the Reaper, I kind of stopped talking about it. But Beastie has a very cool stream. I highly recommend you guys to ever check it out. If you're looking for a fun Terran stream, a very high-level Terran stream, I mean, this guy is 6k MMR plus with his eyes closed almost. Does the craziest builds. You're going to see nukes, you're going to see mech builds. Uh, Beastie is truly uh, one of the most fun and in my opinion underrated streams out there. You guys should definitely take a look at it whenever you see him live on Twitch. Because he's not only a good dude, but he's also an amazing player. Armex once again with a relatively early pull. Mm, gonna finish up, he's once again just gonna make the two links. Uh, nothing else. Uh, just wants to have quick access to the links, wants to make sure you're, if he... I actually kind of wonder though, because it, it feels like he could do the other way around. He could just go hatch first. Oh, 
I guess this man. Well, perhaps this game, I know what he's going to do. He's probably going to take these links via the north side, indeed, kind of make them go a weird route, hoping that the Reaper will just run over here. So he's going to avoid the Reaper, and then he can use these two links to start nibbling away on this SUV, and that's very annoying. Then the Reaper has to turn around, and then BC is going to be forced to pull one or two extra SUVs. However, BC is, you know, BC was like, I wasn't born last night. I looked at that build order tab, and I know that you're spawning pool timing ain't right. So he's keeping the Reaper at home. And that kind of feels that Armax is putting himself in a tiny bit of a de deficit here because this is not the most economic way to open. Gets a little bit of a scout off. Did he actually see anything? No, he didn't. I thought, just, man, these links, they really need binoculars. Should be an upgrade, guys. Five minerals and five gas. <laughs> Far sight. Just uh, to please all the Warcraft fans out there. That switch to Zerg. I wish I was one of them. This is one Reaper is going to make his way across the map. He's going to scout this relatively quick third hatch. It's also uh, dropped over here on the low ground, which of course is standard, but every now and then you see players take it over here on the north side of the natural. See if this Reaper can get anything done. That Queen is kind of sleeping on the job, but Lings are out, so it's safe to say that this Reaper is going to fall. Beastie probably going to try to pick off one drone with the grenade, and he will get a drone. I mean, that's the best he could hope for. First two Hellions already making their way across the map. This time it's not a Cloak Banshee follow-up, at least not yet. It's just a Viking. Probably going to hunt down some more overlords. Man, these Hellions, they are so cool. Those are the coolest Hellions. Reminds me a little bit of my, uh, my old days when I played Destruction Derby. And there was another game. Carmageddon, I think it was called. I think it had a game like that on the box. I don't know if there's anybody else out there. This is kind of cool. He's faking the Cloak Bench over here, hoping that an Overlord could fly in and perhaps cut his upgrade. Unless he's actually going to make it finish, and then I look really stupid. I mean, Ravens are incredibly good in Legacy of the Void ever since they got changed, so maybe he just wants to uh, get a couple of Ravens out. As his Overlord will get sniped by the Viking. And that's the first Overlord that does go down. Six Hellions. This is actually something that Armax is going to have to respect. Armax doesn't have that much. He has four Queens and ten Links. I don't think that's going to be enough. Unless he gets, of course, a little bit of a wall off going. I'm not sure how good the Belgians are in building walls. There is that first Raven, so it's definitely not a fake. This is going to you know, be very annoying with some good old Raven arrest. And then there is a chance that not only will we see him mech it up, I'm already feeling it, guys. I've been watching that Nathania stream just like I've been watching the BC stream. BC is a memer. He likes his battle cruises. <laughs> now we're a long way off battle cruises, but perhaps there is a chance. All I'm saying, guys, is that there is a chance. During all of this, a couple of drones actually popped from this hatch, and three drones went down. It's a little bit sloppy. That's a lot of Hellions. A lot of Roach is being produced by Armax, and he also has all these queens. So I kind of wonder, perhaps he could go for a Nidus network. I know that's not the most common build in the current meta. But against what Beastie is doing, that could potentially be decent. If you're able to unload a whole bunch of roaches and a bunch of queens in the Terran's main, perhaps he was able to get something done. Well, it seems like that's not going to be the case. Let's take a look at the production tab. And it's nothing but drones for Armex for now. As BC is adding on his second factory. That first Raven is going to make his way into the main base. There's a couple of links going for the run by as well on the other side of the map. I'll take a look at it real soon as we see this auto turret go down. There was a wall up there, so absolutely nothing to see. Good reaction time over here by Armax. I believe that's the only drone he lost there. This Raven should have one kill. These Hellions are looking for... <laughs> These Hellions are so cool. I just, in my mind, I see these Hellions just like not shoot at the links, but they'll just hit them with their cars. They just drive them over and scoop them up in the air and needle them in front. As, uh, the second auditor went down. Actually got three drones this time. And now one more Raven is going to show up. That's Raven number two. Now there's going to be a Banshee follow-up as well. This is going to be really damn annoying for Armex to deal with. He's already down in Warkas. There is really not an option for him to run across the map because if that happens, all these Hellions are going to run into... That's so many Hellions! What the hell? 17 Hellions! I mean, the skin is really cool, Beastie, but... <laughs> I'm not sure if it's that cool. We'll take a look at it as he's starting to add his second armory as well. Infestation pit has been going down. 
curious to see what Armist is going to do with it. Perhaps we can see some Swarmos. Swarmos are actually incredibly powerful. It's just kind of hard to get there without being behind. These Roaches, they, uh, they're feeling quite adventurous, engaging into 17 Hellions. These are some badass Roaches, because if I would see a Hellion like that, I would disengage, guys. I'd turn around, go back home, and ask for reinforcements. Now there is a Banshee, so these Roaches will still do that. Meanwhile, the Viking has pretty much denied Armex Ar Ar from... I wouldn't say Amex. Amex is really cool as well. Armex from any map vision. Meanwhile, the Raven's still just being annoying, dropping auto turrets left and right. Four more drones have gone down. And I know that never was there a moment where like 12 or 16 drones went down at once. But if you take a look at it, 12 drones have fallen throughout the entirety of this game. And those things do really start to add up. Then also take into consideration that Armex's opening is not the most economic opening ever. Opens up with a pool before the hatch, gets a couple links out, tries to be annoying. Things are not going his way. This beastie tried to be cute over here, splitting off his Hellions. Would have been really cool if he showed these Hellions on creep and maybe pulled the Roaches out of position. Instead, this is going to be a Hydra then. It's going to complete morphing. There's a Spore in the main, but it's not that hard for a Raven to just avoid the Spore and still drop the other turret. So we can take a look at the main base of Beastie. I said it in game one. Beastie is the type of Terran player that can do it all. He is obviously a, a bio player, but he absolutely loves to make it up as well. This Raven has like 3 HP. It's ridiculous. This time, a couple of links will take care of that auto turret, so he doesn't end up losing any drones. There are the nine swarm holes, and I feel that if anything, I don't want to make it sound like Armex is that far behind. I don't want to use the words like, if there is one thing that could get him back into this game, it's Swarmhost. I don't want to go that far, but Swarmhost are an incredibly, uh, incredible unit. And if these Locusts can get on top of the Hellions, these Hellions will melt. Unless they get great volleys off another Locust and kind of one-shot them. But since there's a couple of Roaches in the mix as well and a few Hydras behind it, I like what Armex is doing because I think with any other unit composition, this really would have been quite tough. So I kind of like the idea of swarm most. Scan goes done. Beastie does. Uh, he should be able to see it. Those swarm are pretty fat. I think in the end he uh, he got it there. Wow, that's a badass helmet as well. Look at this guy. He's like, yeah, run away, cowards. That's what he does. Here are the Swarmos. They're going to pop a couple of Locusts, and let's see if he can get anything done with his first wave of Locusts. This is a pretty big moment for Armex. Over here. The WCS Austin European Qualifier. He's going to split the Locusts up. That's kind of interesting. A couple of them are not doing much in the natural, but a few of them are going to make it into the main. He's going to be able to work on a few of these add-ons. First tech lab will fall. Second one will fall as well. I've learned one thing. If you ever wonder if Locusts are going to kill something or not, Always say they will, because that DPS is insane. A pretty decent engagement over here, but this is not a fight I think that Armex can win. I mean, that's Blue Flame Hellions, they've got upgrades, there are Banshees above it, there's barely any anti-air. few more links actually doing some really good work. 12 SUVs have gone down. This is nice, but he really needs some Locust Swarmos. Get to work. You guys need to save this base. Without the Swarmos, this is going to be really hard. And don't forget about these Banshees. There really isn't that much NTR. A couple of these Swarmos take a lot of damage from the tank. That's a good engagement, though, Armax. That's actually a very good engagement. And these Hellbats are gone. The tanks are gone. And is there enough NTR left? I think there is Transfuse. Drops the ball on the Transfuse. But with 13 additional Hydras on the way. Well done. I'm very impressed here by our Belgium Zerg, because this was not the perfect start for him. But he actually, uh, not only did he get some serious work there done on the other side of the map, he was able to buy enough time. Like, this was not a fight here that he really wanted to take, but he knew that he needed to buy just a little bit of time for himself to pop a few additional Locusts. And that's exactly what he did. And in the end, he got a pretty damn decent fight. However, BC, I'm sure that BC has been in this situation before. He's got a couple of Hellbats, or excuse me, Hellions, and one Hellbat on the north side of the map. He's going to try to pull his army from, uh, from Armex out of position because he wants to secure his fifth base. You don't want to let a mecking Terran player get five bases. One of the weaknesses of mech is that it's really hard to secure those additional bases. If they get five bases, however, all these stories about mech being weak, guys, they're false. This is really hard to get up to five bases. 19 drones have gone down. All of these drones over here have been roasted. 
Uh, meanwhile, Armac has done... No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, questionable engagement. Not sure what the Locusts are doing. A couple of PDDs go down as well. And I'm not sure. I don't think he has enough. No, all these Hydras are going to go down. They will get close on top of these tanks, but not close enough. And this game is just turning into a real bloodbath. But as both players take a lot of losses on each side, Armac said, I've had enough. You're a Mecking Terran. I didn't kill the CC. Looking at the supplies, I mean, I know that Todd is watching out there somewhere, and he's like, please, look at the supply. I'm looking at it, Todd, and it was pretty close. Work account, 48 against 45. Of course, there is mules. You know, overall supply, 127 against 105. Shame, because that fight defensively with the Swarmos was amazing for Armex. I don't think that could have gone any better for him. He bought enough time, had a beautiful concave, had the Locusts coming in from the south, Roaches and Hydras, uh, or the other way around, they were coming in from the north, actually. It was awesome. However, attacking into a Terran becomes a whole lot harder than just defending and then popping the Locust. And that was not a perfectly executed attack. Those Hydras looked awfully slow as well of uh, Creep. As my admin is whispering me, he says, I've got a ZVZ ready for you. Well, I've got a commercial break ready for you. <laughs> no, just kidding. We can, we can go ahead and... Uh, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's just jump into it, guys. The more StarCraft, the merrier. We can always take a look at the bracket uh, after this ZVZ. I am not sure which game this is going to be. There aren't actually, you know, obviously, guys, I'm a Protoss player, and I would love to see some Protoss, but if I look at that bracket, there aren't that many Protosses that I really think of. Like, all right, that guy's going to go far. Like, Shadone is good, but he has a tough bracket. Maybe a round two match could be fun. Of course, there's Space Marine.